Okay. Okay. What's going on? We got singer, songwriter, survivor. Miss Kia Jeffries in the building. Welcome, yes. Kia. Hey, what's going on, Sean Prez? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you, girl. How's my city? How's New York? New York is cold. Uh, New well. York is cold. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's not that cold yet. Yo, this weather changing. New York is cold. I don't know. I I, I need to move down to Florida or something. Uh, maybe, maybe. It may be. We in Georgia now, though. We in Georgia, Florida. Virginia. Nah, I hear that. No <laughs> but check it, Key. I want to go back to the beginning. I mean, originally, don't act like you ain't from New York. I'm from Queens, you New baby. New York zone. Left Rack City. Okay. Iraq. Well, what? Oh, Left Rack City? Left Rack City, yes. It's so much talent that came out of Left Rack. Didn't Rack. we do that? Oh, my God. Didn't we do uh, that? Yo, what, what was it? What was it about Left Rack? Like y'all got so much damn time. Is it in the water? Is I don't it something know. on your kid? So I guess maybe it's the layout, the location, because Left Rack City, we are right, you know, we're like 25, 20 minutes from the city. We are like, you know, 15, 20 minutes from Brooklyn. Uh, you can get to the Bronx in about 15 minutes, go right over the bridge. You know what I'm saying? So where Left Rack was, right on the LIE. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. we, you yep. know, we had many cultures. You know, we had, you know, you got Nori, you know, you got Ock, you got basketball, you know what I'm saying? We got, you know, it, it was a, cra a great place to be. And then we all congregated there. A lot of the Queensbridge people would come to Left Rack, you know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of the Jamaica Queens people would come to Left Rack, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, shout out to everybody, especially even the untold ones from Left Rack, because Midnight Blue is a beast. And I'm going to just leave that there on Vlad TV. Yes, I did, Midnight Blue. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. Before we go any further, I got to give a, a shout to my boy Nori, um, DJ EFN, okay. Drink Champs. They just won an award at yes. the BET Awards. Shout yes. to them. Yes. Well-deserved, guys. Yes. You know, you were talking about Left Rack. You of talking course. about, like, like brought Nori up. We, we got to salute him and his partner, DJ EFN. And, and obviously... EFN reps, um, both of them now rep Miami, right, which right. is your backyard right, right now. So right. we that's what we're doing. You know, so me and Nori, you know, we go back, of course, to the Akinelli days. You know, I'm on a record with Nori and Heather Hunter, if y'all remember that song, Big D. And Akinelli's <laughs> on the end of that. That's me on that joint, you know what I'm saying? Uh, shout you know, out to I Scott didn't know that Storch. Was you on that. And that was produced by Scott Storch. So, you know, that, that was a big record, you know what I'm saying, for those times. And, um, you know, Ak wrote Heather's verse, and he's on there. So, yeah, we all, you know, we, we grew up in the hood. You know, shout out to Chibs, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, Kenny, Kenny Anderson, you know what I'm saying? Kenny you Smith, You know, let me even. ask you something. What what is it? Because we were talking about Left Rat specifically, yeah. but what is it about Queens? Because you're naming all of these names now, like so, I, you know. And I and I'm from the Bronx, right? Um, but but being part of this culture, mm -hmm. you have to give it like to 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 us when I was coming up. You know, Queens was the nice borough or thought right. of at that time as the nice borough. But it's so much talent from the 50s. Well, think to about how y'all treated run us. Run DMCs. Queens is the bastard child, the bastard, like like the 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 the, the whack borough, the, the soft borough mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. time, right? So we had to be overachievers, kind of sorta. I th that's kind of how I so, look so at it. Do you think that's the mentality I that, think that so. all of y'all came with? I think so. LL. You know, I, I feel like, you know, because people use, oh, you live out in the desert. Oh, you live, you know, no, like we really used to think get about it. LL, um, Mob D. Come on. It's just like you can go on, on and, and on, on and day. all the different areas. It's not like everybody was from Jamaica. It's not like everybody was from Queensbridge. It's not like everybody was. We were from all over Queens and we did that. You know, and and I think it was because, yes, we, we you know, we were constantly being, you know, Brooklyn, money making, Manhattan, you know, we didn't have, mm -hmm. we had, you know, quiet queens. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you live in the desert. So, you know, we had to, we I, I guess we was all young thinking the same stuff. You know, all of us doing music was like, yo, we got to, you know, like they're going to respect, they're going to put some respect on queens. And, and we nah. did that. 
You know, you cannot talk about this culture and not give Queens its props. I mean, you know, we we talked about Queensbridge, but I can't even move this interview on without shouting out Nas, like like one of the greatest MCs to yes. ever touch a microphone. Yes, it's it's just impossible. So, you know, shout to to. Queens, the whole Queens. And I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it up to Queens as as a hip hop R and B fan and, and and part of the culture. Thank they you. they really did their thing, man. And I will okay. take that for Queens. Yes. There you go. Musically, was it always a part of who you were? Where where did this whole affinity for music come into your life? Yes. Yeah, so I'm an only child. Both my parents are from Memphis, Tennessee. So they wow. they brought me to New York. I've been in New York since I was two years old. So because they're that's such a culture shock for them, right? Um, and I, they only have one kid, me. I'm my only child. And um, I think my mom wanted to keep me busy. She didn't want me in the streets of New York, you know? So I took ballet lessons, tap lessons, gymnastics, and I took piano lessons. Shout out to um, uh, R.I.P. to Miss Esther Bentley. She was my piano teacher. And um, I, I like playing the piano, but, you know, it was still something that my mom wanted me to do. But then one day, after I had been taking piano lessons about a year, Miss Bentley said, oh, you're going to sing today. And I said, sing? She said, yeah, I'm going to take you through some runs and you're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, take you through the scales. And she did that. And I love that. And it was mm. classical. Like she taught me. I, I did an aria like this in a gown when I was 16, the whole coming out thing or whatever at the church. Uh, shout out Allen AME, okay, mm -hmm. church in, in Jamaica, Queens, all right? Um, so, yeah, I uh, and I loved the music. And um, when I ended up going to junior high school and high school, I was in the chorus. And, um, you know, I, I always played piano as well so I could read music. And, um, you know, I started making money doing music in high school. You know, working with Paul Simon from Simon and Garfunkel. That was the first. Wow. Yeah, that was the first way I started making money. And um, then doing like gigs uh, in New York, you would get the backstage, remember? And you go to the yep, back absolutely. and you try to go on little auditions for like, you know, plays or musicals or, you know, gigs, different gigs. I, I remember I... Um, I went on a thing for uh, Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam. I know I'm dating myself, but yeah, I went to try to go sing back up for Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam. And um, they said she was intimidated because I sang too good. And I was like, oh, oh really? Well, excuse me. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know. Get it, I, Kia. I've been having, I had fun. I, I did weddings and bar mitzvah thing. You know, they were paying us like, Back then, you know, a buck fifty an hour, you know, four hundred, five hundred for the day, you know, for the doing that gig, the weddings and, the, you know, so I just I love singing. It's always been a part of my life. I've always made money doing it. Songwriting came into play. Um, if you remember uh, New Edition uh, back then, um, uh um, it was a dude. We had the manager of New Edition lived in Left Rack City. I don't know if y'all know this. Who? New Edition is, is used to Brooke? come. Uh, his name was Rick Roberts. Rick, okay, I don't Rick know. Rick Roberts and the guy, other dude that was the manager was Steve something. And they used to come and we was little girls, but it was like, oh my God, new edition. Oh, you know, like we would go crazy. So um, he was one of my first managers and encouragers. And he was the person that started telling me to write, you know, why don't you, you know, write what you want to, you know, be. So I, I had a group then. We were the city girls. I had a group called the <laughs> city girls. So when city girls came out, I was like, oh. Okay. Are you serious? Right. Get yeah. out of here. No, literally had three girls, three girls singing group called the City Girls. And um, one of our mentors was uh, the bass player for Steve Arrington. So I worked with real musicians. You know, I came from that era and that time where people were, you know, they were still funk, had just, you know, kind of died, you know, you know. So, you know, I, I have all these influences. I, I sang back up for Shaka Khan, you know. You, you know, even as I'm listening to you, um, your story is so reminiscent. You're making me think of of Miss Jones from Queens. And, and speaking of that, have you you guys ever bump heads, you yes, and Miss Jones? Because as you're talking about your love for singing as a little girl and in and, and your journey, you know, I'm thinking because that's exactly how Miss Jones speaks about 
her upcoming and singing long before she ever got put on. Yes. And, and I'm like, yo, they're both from Queens. I wonder if they ever bumped heads. I'm telling you, Queens, like I said, it just, and then being in Queens is not close to the, nothing. It is, but it ain't. Like on Correct. the train, so it's Correct. not easy. You know, you you gotta get a usually get a cab to the train station because most people can't just walk to the train in Queens, right? So again, we just kind of had to be a little little push a little harder, be a little more overachievers. So I was I was out there. I had the fake ID, and I used to go down to the village to the open mics and um and sing. And I mean, I met Phyllis Hyman there. You know, mm, the legendary, the legendary Phyllis Hyman. R.I.P. The legendary Phyllis Hyman got on stage and sang back, background for me when I was singing. Get out of here. I can't make this stuff up. I How, can't make this uh, stuff up. Are you up. serious? I was singing Sweet Thing. They had left the mic up there. She had just came home from tour, and they left the mic up there. Shout out to the Village Underground. And they left mm -hmm. the mic up there for her, and she was like, I'm tired. I'm going to just sit here. Just leave it up there. So when I went up and started singing Sweet Thing, she got up. And I said, oh. And I passed, I'm trying to pass her the <laughs> mic like, yes, ma'am. Get get it. She was like, no, girl, you got this. I'm going to sing back up for you. I was like, mm. and, uh, you know, we don't have no show, social media. There's Kia, no camera I, phones. I, I, I we pray, could, you know, yeah, that you wasn't had to recorded? be there. That, that wasn't recorded? No. Nah. No. Oh my God, no. that is such a moment. And I love me some Phyllis Come Hyman. Come on. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you, you're from New York. Yes. You're telling me all these places that you sang when you was coming up. Yes. But you didn't mention the Apollo. Yes, I did. Yes, I did sing at the Apollo, of course. I actually won a couple of times on Showtime at the Apollo, the TV show. And you can find that on the Roku, the Fire Stick or whatever. And this was during the time where uh, Sinbad was the host. And um, mm. Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson was actually in the audience when I won my first time and he threw money at me and he was married to Robin <laughs> Givens. You could see him like in the film. You could see him standing up and throwing the money at the stage at me. It was it was awesome. It was awesome. Are you serious? Yes. Good for you. OK, so so we we, we got the credentials. You're official. Okay. You're, you're 100 percent official. <laughs> <laughs> and the crazy thing is like like. For anybody who remembers those times, like if you was around in, in the 90s, that, that's the golden era of, of this whole music thing. And this is when you really coming up and you're starting to blossom. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk about um, you getting your first deal. Okay. How did that come about? It, it, it's a group that most people probably won't remember, Oscar, but y'all were signed to Epic Records, correct? Yeah. yeah. How, how did y'all come together? How did you go from being a soloist to a part of a group? And then how did y'all get the deal? Yeah, so uh, doing my rounds, going on these auditions and singing at these different open mics and stuff, I met this white chick named Sally Reese. She was a blonde, a natural blonde, head down to her behind from like some part of Missouri. Uh, Blue Springs, mm -hmm. Missouri, I think she was from. And um, we, you know, we met, kind of clicked. At, the, at one of on, at an audition, and we started going to auditions together, and we ended up talking about putting a group together because she could sing like she was a white girl from the Midwest, but she like, ooh, that girl could she could belt out a song, you know what I mean? I can't say that she sounded black, but she had soul, and it was enough, you know what I'm saying? So we ended up putting a group together, and um, if you remember, Color Me Bad, they were Absolutely. kind of a multiracial guy group. So we were thinking, had that mindset when we put Oscar together. So it was me, another black girl, a Japanese singer, who she was just so dope, named Hiromi, like literally Japanese, and wow. and uh, Sally, and we put Oscar together. And it was. Did, like, did y'all hold auditions? How, how did you even find uh, like a Japanese R&B singer? I know, right? So no, so um, the other girl, the other black girl, I met her in my circuit doing the weddings and the bar mitzvahs. Her and her husband mm -hmm. had a band, and she was real cute. And I, you know, recruited her. And I cannot remember. I, I want to say Sally probably found her Romy, maybe at an audition also or something like that. I think we ran into her somewhere. So no, we never had auditions. We organically came together, and it, it was blessed. And um, you know, we ended up getting signed to a production deal back then. It wasn't 360 deal production deal back then <laughs> and um this was two character productions and if you know the name that is troy taylor and charles farrar and they did boys to men they did two songs on boys to men yep. 
al first yeah. album and they blew up off that, okay? And now Troy Taylor is responsible for um, Trey Songs. You know, it's so much history in this conversation right here. So <laughs> you go on to hook up with them, sign a production deal, and I'm assuming their production deal was signed to Epic. Right, they get they got us the the deal. The yeah, they got the deal with Epic. Yep. Mhm. Mm yeah. Why the group break up? Ooh. Uh. Why did the group break up? Because y'all broke up before you even came out with an album. Yes. So yeah, that I don't know. Um, just different times. People wanting different things didn't go probably as well as people hoped or thought it was going to. And um, you know, I guess nobody was um pushing to do the next album. I, I think some breakdown of communication happened between us and the production company. And mm -hmm. then moving forward, they were kind of focusing on other things. And then me and Sally, were we were kind of the drivers of the group. And the other two girls were kind of more passive. And, um, you know, we me and Sally stayed in touch for a long time. Actually, Sally's boyfriend is Madonna's baby daddy which is a whole nother story, but he was with Sally <laughs> when he ran into Madonna walking down the street and Madonna was like, yo, I want you to be my baby father. And he left Sally like the next day and we had Are to talk serious? her down off a building. Like, I can't make this stuff up. Like, this is my real life. This is Me my real meaning life. Meaning like Madonna's oldest child, Lourdes. Yes. Carlos Holy Leon, smoke. look it up. I can't make there this stuff go. up. Yep, Carlos yep, Leon, there you go. Carlos Leon, that's the name. Go. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... The group Oscar, it didn't pan out the way you wanted it to. It didn't pan out. Yes, but I was so excited, even because the process, I, I learned so much. And um, like the fir our first single was written by me and Carl Thomas. You know, that's where I met Carl Thomas. And he's still my friend to this day. You know, that was before he was a solo artist. Hold on. I know Carl Thomas is from Chicago. He was in New York at mm -hmm. that time? Yes, he had come to Chicago, from Chicago to New York to, to you know, get his, get his deal, get a deal, get in the music industry. And he joined a guy group. This guy group was signed to a production deal with Charles and Troy as well. And they kind of pushed them to the side to work with my girl group because at the time, the girl group in Vogue and all these different things was going on. So they was trying to kind of like catch the momentum with the girl groups at the time. So they kind of, you know, jumped on our thing because we were multiracial. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Like, see, people, th this is the part of the story that I always love to talk about because everybody thinks that that. These stars just, you know, one day they went in the studio, the next day they put the record out, and all of a sudden, their whole life changed. Right. They don't see the backstory. They don't see the failure after failure after failure. They don't see the fact that, you know, I, I, I've been doing this since I was a child. Right. And, and, and I done heard more no's than I care to even hmm. admit. Before I heard the first yes, I was in a group and then I went solo or I was solo and then I had to be in a yeah. People don't look because even me, you know, Carl Thomas is is my boy. That's family. Mm -hmm. um, and you're telling me parts of his story. I didn't even know. Yes. It's, it's crazy. OK, back to Miss Kia Jeffries. That's me. Kia. Everybody knows you and even if they don't know your name they know that beautiful voice of yours Thank you. because in 1996 a fellow left rack city artist Akinelli comes out with a song put it in your mouth <laughs> and you are on that hook blowing yeah. how did that song come to be at that time that was a very very aggressive record. Yeah, that's a good, a that's a nice like... word. Aggressive, that's a good <laughs> word. Controversial, uh, raunchy, you know. Um, so, you know, I, um, people might think that Put It In Your Mouth is the first kind of hip hop thing I did, but not not so. I worked with Shaheem, and um, I'm the one the singing on his child. first single, The On And On. Um, I was working, like oh, I said. Oh! Yeah, that's me on there. Get out, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, shout out to the whole, you know, Wu, Wu affiliates and everything. Uh, I had worked with um, 
if you remember Finesse and Sinquist, you of know, course. we're all from Queens. I worked with Shauna when she was in that group. Um, she's from Chicago. She was it was a her a two girl group. Oh, come on, give me the name. Oh, um, from Chicago. Yeah, Shauna from from D D T V. Yeah, but we we we'll think about that. Yeah, she it, that had, definitely so she was in a two girl group produced by Kanye West, and I was on the joint there. So I've been I had been doing this. So I mm -hmm. we from Left Rack together, and he was like, "Who can I get to sing on something that's really already you know saying popping?" He came to me, so he comes to my crib like, "Yo, I need to come see you. Need to holler, whatever." I'm like, "Okay." Now remember, Ak is a different type of dude. He's driving an old school flat top Hummer. The old, real military mm -hmm. Hummer yep. through the hood. We looking at this dude like, well, who are you? What are you doing, right? <laughs> so he comes. He's like, I got an idea for this song. So he comes. He plays the beat. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And when he sang or tried to sing the hook to me, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, get, come on. I want you to be like up here like, please. And he's up like, okay. And he was like, yeah, and my verse, I'm going to talk about, you know, how I want my thing. And you, I need you to write your verse about how you want your, you know, your vagina. And I was like, <laughs> that's what I was like. OK, I'm into it. I'm into it. Fuck it. Yeah, OK. So he left me with the beat. And my homegirl, I'll never forget this. Um, shout out to uh, Raquel. Raquel Dwyer, she lives down here in Georgia with me. She was with me when I wrote my lyrics for Put It In Your Mouth. And she was like, what you going to write? I was like, let me see. I don't know. And the beat came on. And I don't know, just in a rush, that whole verse just came to my brain. And I just started writing that shit. So we go in the Get studio. We go in the studio maybe a couple of weeks later. And I laid my verse in one take. He had asked me, did I have anything for an intro? He was like, I want to do something spicy in the beginning. So they think it's like a love ballad. And then all of a sudden we going to come in with the, with the, with the beat. So me and the producers looking at him like, that's so crazy, but you might got something on your hands with that. Like, it just was so <laughs> ridiculous and far-fetched. But yeah, why not? Because back then, no one wanted to copy anyone. I don't know what's going on with hip hop today. Nobody wanted to be like somebody. You didn't want your name to even be a little bit fam similar to some other artist that's already popping his name because you're trying to make your stamp and, and, you know, make yourself, you know, the top. So, you know, we wanted to, we always wanted to step outside the box. So we did that. And that's me playing the piano in the beginning and everything. Mm. So, yeah. So I went in, I recorded that. I did my verse and it was about maybe six, seven uh, um, Ox homeboys in there. And we had been joking and laughing while they was getting it ready. And then when I went and did the verse, I did it in one take and I came out and it was dead quiet. In the studio, like I walked back in the booth, in the, you know, in the, the, this control area and they was quiet. And I said, ah, good. He was like, yeah. I was like, you sure? He's like, yeah. I said, well, what's going on? Why? What's going on with them? Why are they so quiet? He was like, who are these niggas? I said, yeah. He said, oh, they dicks is hard. I was like, what? <laughs> I said, I said, is that what, that's why y'all quiet? Y'all dicks is hard? They was like, yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> and so I knew, knew I had it. it. I knew I was like, okay, niggas, dicks is on. Let's go. I don't know. And I was a baby. I was a teenager. Oh. What can I say, man? <laughs> New Yorkers, man. That's Yo. what we do. Yo, but you, you said something I want to touch on. You was talking about the cardinal sin hmm. of hip hop back then. Hmm. It's, it, times have really changed yeah. because back then, if you sounded like somebody, if you remotely sounded like somebody, you would have got punched in your face. Right. The fans didn't want nothing to do with you. Yes. Whoever you sounded like, they had beef or with if you. if your name, if you tried to take a name, if you called yourself Correct. Nora, and if we got Nori, we slapping you because, come on, it's too close. Stop. You know, get out of here. You know, like, no. And, and because of that, it pushed creativity forward it made you That's right. be creative yes. because you knew coming into this thing damn she sound this sounds too similar to her or you know what the way i wrote that verse and the way i'm spitting it it sounds too close to the way he spit right. his 
you had to be creative. And that's why it's called that golden era, yes. because everybody was forced to be an individual. And what's so crazy is now times have changed. You almost can't get a deal if you don't sound like, like somebody. somebody. Right. Right. Is that is that the most ironic thing in the world? It's really, really strange to me. Um as I listen to, and, and I want to just big up all of my female artists because y'all are doing y'all thing right now. It's like the female artist era. You know what I'm saying? The hottie era. But uh, let's switch it up, ladies. Go ahead and get your individuality out there because uh, if um, uh, Megan Thee Stallion is going, ah, ah, Lotto, I don't need to hear you going, ah. Like, mm -hmm. that's Megan's thing. You know what I'm saying? If... Um, Whatever, you know, Nicki Minaj do, you know, Cardi, I don't need you to do that. Or Cardi, you got your own, you know what I mean? I'm just saying. It's just, you know, we know people for stuff. You know Jada for the hat. If anybody mm -hmm. else do that, it's going to be a problem. Am I, that am is I so right or real. am I right? That is, no, it is so real. But, but honestly, if it wasn't for that era, I don't know, you know, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for... Because that's that's where it all exploded. Yeah. So so shout to the to the founders. A absolutely. But but if you're coming into the nineties and early two thousand, that's where it really exploded. That's where the money started that's getting where the real money good. Money started coming in, yes. But but it was all because you were forced, like literally forced, to be original and to be creative. I remember Akinelli paying me five thousand dollars to show up at a strip club and stand on the side until he does put it in your mouth and I come up and just do my verse and walk back off. Are you serious? Yes. The money was the good back then. <laughs> the money was good I back then. I remember one week uh, Jay-Z was at, um, oh, what's the spot down in the, in the, in almost in the village? Almost in the village, the big, big spot. Well, Jay Z was Which? at a big joint. Um, that ain't Webster think... Hall, huh? Yes, Webster Hall. Yes. Okay. Jay Z was at Webster Hall one week, and he flooded it, right? Because he was Jay Z doing his thing. But the following week, we tripled the people that came. Are you out. serious? Yo, put it in your mouth was a movement, and it's crazy how the song is its own like thing now. Even it's like it's um, it's got a cult following. No, it does. It does. And it, 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 it is so much of a of a hip hop classic, especially if you're a hip hop purist. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got to ask you, please tell me you got some publishing on that record. So I own 40 <laughs> percent of Put It In Your Mouth by myself. Get out of here. You own 40 percent of that record? I'm going to tell you why. So I can now, like I said, I was, you know, just getting into the hip hop and stuff, right? And he had done a few like features on different things when he got the situation with Loud Records. So when he did to put it in your mouth, um, he didn't know about publishing. And I, cause I asked him, I said, okay, so when we went to the studio, I was like, all right, you know, I'm professional. So I had like paperwork, my little, my little publishing <laughs> document, like, okay, what's the splits gonna be on this? And blah, blah, blah. He was like, what you mean? I was like, publishing. He's like, oh, well, I mean, I don't know. I'm glad you told me about it. I was like, yeah. He was like, well, look, you take 40% and we'll split the rest. And that's how that went. So, of course, you know, we had to give the sample, you know what I'm saying, some money. But after that, I get 40 and they own the rest. The rest you know of what it. I'm so the 60% they split. Si they split okay. that with the, yeah. So, so, so I, I ain't getting in your business, but, but let's, let's, let's. <laughs> Let's just say that song's been good to you because yes. Jay Z done quoted lyrics from it. J. Cole, Big Pun, Red Man. Like that song, every time somebody either samples it, uses a part of it, uses a, a, a quote from it, you catching a check. So I'm so, I, I'm going to use just that right there and I'm going to send that to Jay Z and Missy mm -hmm. because they did not pay me. <laughs> Jay-Z and Missy still owe me money for that one minute man big puns estate R.I.P you still owe me money okay <laughs> okay I said girl. big puns I mean estate you still owe me money you know shout out to everybody that paid me J. Cole called me and cleared it with me 
directly. He called my phone. Yeah, shout he out. He literally called he you. He called my phone in 2014. And mm. was like, hey, is this kid Jeffries? This is J. Cole. I was like, nah. Because <laughs> that's my son's favorite rapper. My son is 24. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, at, the, at the time, that was my son's favorite rapper. Probably still is, you know? So, yeah, wow. it's wonderful, you know? It, it, it's a great feeling. I'm still chasing old money, you know what I mean? So when them old checks come in, thanks to this. Thank you, Vlad. Good get this money. <laughs> I'm going to get, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get y'all a little finder's fee just for saying that, Sean. I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um the nineties again, it was good for you. Um nineteen ninety eight, if I got my if I got my facts right, forecast, the group forecast. Yes. Yes. You were in a new group at this time. Mm -hmm. Call forecast and y'all at, at some point, even before I go further into the conversation, wasn't at some point, if my memory serves me correct, y'all were managed by Barry Hankinson? Yes, we were. We were assigned to Barry Hankinson for a hot minute that group forecast. Um, we knew him, you know, shout out to uh, Larry Rudolph, my attorney. Okay. He was my attorney for many, many years in New York and uh, he was very good friends with Barry. You know, Barry managed Tony Braxton. I don't know if people know that. He was married to um, uh, Gladys Knight. Gladys Knight, you know? Gladys Knight. It was crazy. So yeah, he I mean, he, he, he got dude. three kids with Gladys, yeah. actually. Yeah, Barry Hankinson. And for anybody who don't know who, who uh, Barry Hankinson is, this, this, he's the owner of, um, or the founder, owner of Black Ground Black Records. Black Ground Records. Uh, Aaliyah, that's yeah. her uncle, that, actually. Aaliyah's uncle. That was Aaliyah's uncle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, he was that dude. You know, people, you know, our age group, you know, they're like, yes, you know. Exactly. <laughs> but we educated the young people. But yes, um, yeah, Barry was a wonderful influence. And, um, you know, he released us because we were um, signing a, a different situation. And he knew that he couldn't really be, you know, as hands on because he had so many other things going on. So, yeah, you know, we we, we, we out here. OK, so y'all released one album, yes. Any Weather. Yes. Album comes out, does moderately well. Mm -hmm. And then the group breaks up. Mm hmm. I, I, I got to ask you why, and, and I ask you this because it always seems like, especially female groups, they can't seem, seem <laughs> to stay together for a long time. And, and, and granted, there are some that have. Right. I mean, you right in the middle of when, when female groups was blowing. blowing. You had yeah. In Vogue out there, yeah. Brownstone, SWV. Changing Faces, SWV. They, they was all matter of fact that that was the early days of um even Destiny's Child was yeah. on their way yeah. up back yeah. then yeah so wh why is it so hard for female groups to stay together um you know just like it's hard for women to get stay to, to you know get along in a way uh, it's a lot of competition you know um underlying. You know, even though we do all want success, you know, there's kind of jockeying for position sometimes. But um, with the with the group forecast, I'll just say, you know, my pregnancy, me and my husband and my pregnancy could have had better timing. Right. But at the same mm -hmm. time, we were able to incorporate my pregnancy into the theme of the first video, because, as you see, I was big pregnant in that in that um, Miss My Loving video. Um, you know, so we could have worked out. But, you know. There was an issue with me and one of the girls, like a kind of a big issue. And it got bigger once I, you know, decided to have baby and, you know, she felt it was in the way and we could have worked it out because actually they offered us a second album. And, oh. And, and artists, please don't do this. These girls turned it down, y'all, because they was mad. And that's why, you know, I don't know. I was never going to stop. You know what I'm saying? This is what I do. You know what I mean? But I've been doing that before a group, so I'm going to do it after a group too, you know? But it was like, you know, they was a little salty, you know? And I don't know why, because guess what? I got a publishing deal because I already had music out there. I already had to put it in your mouth and a couple of other things. I had said, R.I.P. to Biz Markie. You know, I sang on the B.I.Z. Yep. Uh, it's the B.I.Z. and everything. So I had checks. I had um, publishing. I had... Um, already getting royalties from my vocals, just my, you yep, know. Yep. So I was offered a $100,000 publishing deal. And I said to myself and my husband, hey, I don't want to get this money. And these girls looking at me like, oh, she got money. We didn't get no money. You know, even though they had never written anything. But I 
you know, basically enticed my publishing company to give them a hundred thousand to split. And they mm. did that on my face card. And these girls were still mad at me, you know? You know, you, you may have just <laughs> answered the question that I was trying to ask um, without even realizing it. Girls, they're emotional. Yeah. And, you, you know, you said because they were angry, because they were mad. What does that have to do with business? When you say, say I got that. a dream, this is my love, this is something I want to do with my life. So what if you mad? Right. Do the job. Right. So if they offered y'all another album and the girls turned it down because they was mad, that, that to me, you didn't love this thing in the first place. You couldn't have loved it because your emotion should never stand in the way of the business. I agree. And, I, and that was a hard lesson to learn even for me. You know, I feel like I probably could have handled things better as the, you know, leader maybe. You know, I might have met let my emotions because I kind of was like, well, damn, what <laughs> what more can I do for you bitches? You know, I was of that mindset in the back <laughs> of my mind. I didn't want, you know, I wasn't saying that, but I know my facial expression might have said that because I'm like, I don't know what else to do for y'all, you know, so. You know, and then I ended up just, you know, kind of focusing on my son, raising my son and stuff and, uh, you know, dealing with my crazy marriage, you know. OK, let's segue into this. You mentioned your husband almost in passing, but you wasn't married to a regular dude. No, you're married to a prize fighter, um, not just a prize fighter, but he he literally is, was a cruiserweight boxing champion. Mm hmm. Light Mr. Ernest Mateen. Also. For anybody who is a boxing fan, they, they know him as M16 Mateen. How, how did y'all meet? Huh. So we were managed by um, Ed, Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. We all had the same management at, at one time. And that was the guy, the white Here's man. It's Queens again. Queens. The white man that played Here's Bika. Queens. The white man that played Bika in the, in the Fat Boys movie. Remember that white yep. dude? Yep, he yep, was yep. literally an industry guy for real. And he was our manager back then. And uh, Ed Lover used to host uh, Caroline's Comedy Club, maybe on Wednesdays or something like that. And he invited me to come out. I went out. I'm hanging out with Ed. He pulls me up on stage to sing some little ditty real quick or whatever. And Ernest, my husband, was in the audience with his homeboys. Had on a zoot suit, hat, gold tooth. And hazel contact lenses. And, oh, no, blue. Blue <laughs> contact lenses. And, I mean, he dark as this table, okay, with the blue contact lenses. But he looking good. I didn't know he was a boxer. I don't know. And it, and it so, so happens, Talent the Comedian was there, and he performed that night, and he was somebody that was pursuing me. So he was there trying to get my attention. And then this dude that I didn't know threw money at me on the stage. And I was like, okay. So... I collected the money. I went, sat down. He comes over and I think he coming to, you know, you know, shoot his game or whatever. So he comes over and he's like, uh, I see you. You what, what was that? What was that you were eating? I was like, oh, my vitamin C tablet. He was like, yeah, can I get one? And I was like, sure. And I gave him one. He was like, thank you. And walked off. I was like, oh, oh, this is what we do it. OK, it's on. <laughs> so now I take the money. I fold it up real nice. Get, put it all face up. And then I walk over to his table with him and his homeboys and I say, OK, thank you so much. I'm good, sweetie boo. And I gave him that. And then I walked <laughs> out. Walked out. Of course, he had to get up and, you know, and the chase was on. So and um, it's funny because I like talent already. I knew him. But talent was stinky drunk that night. And I can't do a drunk man. I never was into like, you know, so I was like, oh, let me see what this dude talking about. So we started talking. He let me know he was a boxer. I was like, oh, okay. And we started dating. And um, that's how we met at Caroline's Comedy Club. You know? Crazy. How about that? Wow. Um, I, okay. I, and I'm just curious. Uh, because dating a fighter, that's very different yeah. than dating <laughs> somebody who works nine to five. Yeah. Like some of the, some of the best prize fighters in the world, 
what makes them great is they come from very, very difficult mm. beginnings. Yeah. Like it's it's rough, but but that those rough beginnings and that aggression, it's it's what allows them to be great in the ring. Yeah. They're used to taking pain. Yeah. They're used to dishing out pain. What was your what was the attraction? Were you just <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could take from. I want to know what was the I mean, attraction there so for you. So again, I when I met him, I didn't know he was a boxer. But this mm-hmm. is this is a guy that actually went to college. Uh, he graduated from like Brooklyn Community College or something. Um, so he, you know, he's an intelligent man. Um, but he he definitely was a boxer. He definitely was more of a hustler. You know, I thought when I married him, I thought I married a boxer that hustled a little bit. I found out I married a hustler that boxed a little bit. Mm. Okay, so he was a hustler from Brooklyn that found out that boxing could be a dope ass hustle for him, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. But his father was a boxer, so he came to it naturally. But he wanted to play basketball. He said his father forced him to keep up the boxing thing. So, you know, that was interesting. Uh. So, you know, we we bonded over a few things. um, And, uh, you know, he treated me very well. I had not... I, I wasn't a person to really date hustlers, date street guys and stuff. Um, I, when I was in high school, I think I dated like one dude and he used to leave me at his mama's house while you'd be slinging on the block. That wasn't fun for me. You know, I'm a girl that travels all over the world and stuff. Like, I, I want to sit in your mama's house waiting for you to, you know, and then take me shopping. Like, that wasn't it for me. So I hadn't done much of that. So this guy, he was nice to me. I was grown now. He's taking me shopping. He's doing this. He's, you know, buying my mama's stuff. It was I, I'd never been treated like that. I'd never dated these money guys and stuff like that. So, you know, and I've been traveling. I've been touring. I've been overseas and doing all this stuff, you know, after high school and then, you know, my college years in and out of the country and just touring and making money. So I, I didn't have a lot of time to date, you know, and, um, you know, meeting him and him just, you know, acting like he was so gaga. I was like, oh, my gosh, okay. Cool. And he was <laughs> handsome, you know? He was a tall, dark drink of water, you know, with beautiful, beautiful, perfect teeth. It's like, perfect. <laughs> wow. You know, you mentioned that um, y'all had a son together. Yes. What, what kind of father was he? Okay, so this was a complicated man, okay? Uh, he was a boxer, and he was also a Gemini. So if anybody fought, oh right, boy. there you go. My, oh my publicist, yo, if y'all can oh see my boy. publicist's face when I said he was a Gemini, okay? And, um, you know, ladies that date these Geminis, you know, God bless us because they, you know, they're interesting. You know, they say each person has two people in them. So obviously a Gemini got four, right? Because they already a twin, you know? So you're dealing with four personalities. And, um, you know, I loved all four, but uh, I, I want to say, I'm going to say this. The man had mental health issues that I did not know about until he passed away. And I really believe in my heart, had I known about them and knew that he was supposed to be on meds and stuff, I would have done everything to make sure that he did that, you know, and I would have been watching for this. And, you know, and not that I didn't know he had violent tendencies when I married him. I did. But he and I, I thought, were in better place. I never thought it would have gotten to where it did get, you know, and that's why, you know, I'm an advocate for um, domestic violence awareness. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I I speak now about recognizing the signs and not just seeing them, but acting on it like, you know, your life is in daggett danger. You know what I'm saying? Just like you ain't going to stand in front of a moving car and just be like, well, I hope that it sees me and move. No, you're going to get your ass out the way. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But maybe the person might have seen you. You know, maybe they might have seen you, but maybe they wouldn't. But you're going to get out the way either way. You're not going to just wait and see. But it's like we'll wait and see with these men, you know? And that's not just men. I know, I, mean, I know men get hit on too. So, but we'll wait and see when there's love there, when you want to be with the person, when you, you know, you know their background, you know their history. So you know kind of why they're angry and you want to be there for them and everything, you know? Um, you know, shout out to Mita, Mita Laylock. Uh, she was Zab Judah's ex-wife, 
You know, we yep. down here in Very Atlanta too. What up, Mita? Yeah, that's my good friend. Um, you know, she's on Love and Hip Hop now, doing her thing. You know, we talked about this stuff. You know, Zap put hands on her before, and uh, you know, it's a thing. You know, it's an issue. A lot of you know because they're violent and they're 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 they make their living being violent. You know, it's a lot in there mentally that's going on. You know, um, but yeah, man, it, it it was bad, and and it was. We were great, and then we were terrible. Like in the early so, days, so we even were great. before you go forward, even before you go forward, because I really want to know what, what type of father was he. Like, look, he, I understand the, the, good, the relationship between. He was you a two. good father. He he was a good father. He wasn't a typical father. You talking about what a man mean? that ne he never really worked a job because he was a boxer. You know, he was a sports person. You know, so. He, you know, we weren't nine to five people, but he was a good dad. Um, he was a, 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 he spoiled his son. He loved his son to death. He has another child, a grown son, you know, uh, from his first marriage. And um, he was six when me and Ernest met. And he wasn't a great father to that boy until I got into his life. Mm. He and the woman were not doing well. And because of that, he wasn't reaching out to that boy and doing things. And I said, no, that's your son. We're going to, you know, if you're going to be with me, we, we going, he going to be with us. We going to be messing with him. So we would pick him up. We take him shopping. My mother became like his surrogate grandma. He went down to Virginia to stay with my mom, his son, even before I had our son. You know, that's how uh. much I... Yeah, I embraced that. So he learned from that situation to be better, you know. So with my son, he was he was a really, really good father, you know. Um, but he would have his his uh, mood swings. Um, he would have outbursts, but he never put his hands on Zaire until Zaire was trying to protect me from him. OK, and, and I wanted to know the answer to that question, because. And we'll get to to how to, this story um, concluded mm -hmm. later in the interview. But, you know, he sounded like he was a complicated man. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you and him, you you guys had a very, uh, you know, you, like you said, it started off very loving. And then, then everything just went left. Yeah. But him as a fighter, you know, I'm, what, was he was he the type of person who was abusive to his child? Was he somebody who, no, you know what? That's where I draw the line. I love my boy. I, you know, th this is my heart. I spend all my my waking moments with him. So it's yeah. just interesting to get into to his mindset. Yeah. Um, but just getting back to you, wh when did the domestic violence start in y'all relationship? Um. So domestic violence is not only putting hands on you, right? It's also your things you say, you know, how you treat a person, things that you say, um, trying to be controlling. You know, there were little things that I didn't really peep. I had the baby and stuff like that. Um, but I did know his top violent tendencies. Um, I know about his outbursts. If you say something a different way. I, okay, I'll give you one. When we were shooting the video for Miss My Loving, when I was still pregnant with my son, the director, uh, so my husband, when he walked in the room, nobody else was in it. Like, he was the biggest person in the room, okay? He had a huge mm -hmm. personality, and he was a big guy, right? So and um, so he would come through the video shoot and uh, distract it a little bit because he would be trying to talk to the director. Hey, man, what you got going on? And, oh, what's up? And, well, can I be in the video? Or well, what's on? So the director... Um, to kind of get him to, you know, go on. He sent a camera with him and said, yeah, we'll get some footage of you, you know, doing this or that. And told him to go, you know, shadow box somewhere. And the guy sent the camera guy with him or whatever, something like that. And we went on to finish the video. So when the video f finished and they sent me the cut, he did not make the cut. And he was very angry. Like that was the first time since the pregnancy, since I decided to marry him and everything, that I was like, oh, shit. Because he um, he came home, he saw the video, and he destroyed our bedroom. He pulled everything out the closet. He threw, he broke up the stuff in a rage. You know, 
I remember being glad they didn't put hands on me, but knowing like, this could be not so great. You know, like, mm. you know, I felt just a person that could do that. I just was like, wow. And for the reason, like, it wasn't your video. <laughs> you know, like, you box. <laughs> you know, you're a boxer. It's okay. Oh, that nigga played me. He And I get it. As a man, you feel like, you know, he kind of, you know, pushed you up. But you were being overbearing. You were being pushy. You know, you got to know that. So, yeah, he didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. So those, um, yeah. So stuff like that um, would happen. And um, I'd be kind of like, ooh. And I'm an only child. I don't have brothers or sisters. And he knew this. And um, I feel like, you know, when his career kind of maybe started not being so good, because remember, I told you he approached it as a con, which he approached Correct. a lot of things. So, I mean, this is a lot of um, head butting on purpose and ear biting and different things to win or not have to finish the whole fight and different things because he his heart never was in the boxing. You know something? I'm a huge boxing fan, so I'm very familiar with Ernest Mateen. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember you just, wow, um, what a great conversation. Uh, he, he fought James Tony. He did. And I want to say it was the fifth or sixth round. He literally was head buttoned, hit him <laughs> in the back of the head, did all of the stuff you just said. And the legendary referee Mills Lane hmm. disqualified him, hmm. literally disqualified him in this huge fight. And I'm like, why would he do this? Right. And now I get the answer that this wasn't random. It wasn't just that he, no. you know, was out of control. He approached it as a hustle and, and this was his way out. Right, wow. because he didn't really want to get hit too much. He didn't really want to, you know what I mean? Like James Tony will knock your buck off. And put you in the hospital, right? So, oh man, yeah, he'd rather not get hit. He'd rather, you know. But you know what's crazy? Hmm. Because again, you know, I don't expect too many people to know this, but he actually beat the legendary Bernard Hopkins in his career. Like he did. He, he had this, some great. He was no slouch. No, he had some great wins. He, he beat John Sully. I, I, you know, me and Akinelli were at that fight. Akinelli opened, brought him in. For that that uh, Scully fight, you know, um, mm -hmm. so you know we were, you know, we were a power couple, okay, in in the early nineties and, and uh, late mid nineties and, and early two thousands, we were out here, you know, we were everywhere. Everybody knew us, you know. Diddy, uh, we had our baby shower at Justin's for free. Uh, Diddy gave us Justin's uh. for free, you know what I mean? And it was a wonderful baby shower. So. You know, shout out to everybody from that era, man. You know, we was doing it big, man. I missed the 90s. I'm sorry. Woo! Okay. Uh, let's go. Let's fast forward to 2006. Okay. Um, he retires. He retires from boxing. Um, I believe his final record was something like 32 and maybe 12. Uh, I, I could have the numbers off, but, you know, a very respectable career. Um, he... How did things change when he finally retired? Because you're starting to see glimpses of a guy who could possibly be out of control mm -hmm. and you being in a situation that might not be um, great for you. Yeah. When he stopped boxing, the money stops coming in. How, how did things change? Um, so the money didn't stop coming in because he was a con man. So we, uh. would have, we were getting money. Um, we were Bonnie and Clyde. Um, you know, there was a, a, a thing that he would do because he was a boxer. He had a lot of fans, people that loved, you know, him as a boxer. They wanted to be a part of the, they wanted to be in the Ernest Mateen business, right? They might want yep. to manage yep. him or be an investor or something. So even though he was retired, he would tell people he had a fight coming up with, uh, with um, whoever, you know, um, any big name, you know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, I would literally put the paperwork together. I would go online and find the, 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 the page, the thing to put at the top of the page and make it look like official contract. I'm telling on myself, but it is what it is. They say, Vlad, make you tell on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do the documents for my husband. <laughs> and um, 
Yeah. And I mean, we gotten anywhere from twenty thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars put in my bank account. Are you serious? Yes. Yes. So he wasn't scared of people rolling up Everybody knew I drove the G wagon before anybody else had the G wagon. We got the G wagon because of the hustles we was doing, not because of the music. Wow. Yeah. Damn. So I, I gotta ask, like, y'all are running hustles and you conning people. You're not conning people out of hundreds of dollars. No. You're conning people out of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. That that man is from Brooklyn. Yeah, he he know what it is. Yeah, yo, you you got a baby, you him y'all are not worried that yo this is gonna come back like they they gonna run up on us because they want their money. I did so, yes. Um, so now by this time we we're, we're living between New York and Florida because uh, he wasn't exactly retired. There was a time that Zab Judah's dad was his trainer. And we moved down to West Palm Beach. So he was down okay. there um, getting money and uh, working, working out, trying to see if he could get some fights up. And uh, I was in, going back and forth. I was doing my thing. Our son was maybe a toddler by now and everything. Um, so he was, we, would, we were running scams. But the way he did it and the people he was doing it was almost like they couldn't really go to the police because they were legit. Oh. You know? And um, we definitely had to move quickly. A couple of times, like my mom, we were living in West Palm Beach and my, I was on tour and my mom was at the house with Z and um, Ernest's uh, little brother used to live with us. I know. And he had to, um, they had to move quickly. Like I called my mom like, hey, mom, uh, a moving truck is on the way right now. She's like, what you mean? I was like, please don't ask no questions, mommy. You just got to move. OK, you're in danger. If you stay there, you and Z and, and kid just go. The truck is coming. They're going to move everything. They're going to do it for you. Just here's the address for the new house. New house. Yes. Just relax. <laughs> like he had already bought a house or the other, you know, wow. somewhere else. And it, it was crazy. And the people hit my phone. And they were like, yeah, we know, you know, we know you got the money and we see that you cleared it. Cause he told me to go to the bank and get it out. Cause they were powerful enough to try to like, you know, do something to the mm -hmm. account or something. So I was at the bank at, you know, 845 <laughs> waiting, <laughs> you know? So this is, you know, this is what we did for a while. And, but at a point we did kind of have enough money that I was like, listen, we can't just do these scams for the rest of our lives, right? We got to invest in something. I wanted to invest in a McDonald's back then. It was only 35 grand to get your own McDonald's franchise. And I feel like that would have been it. And, um, you know, he loved the con. Like, you know, some people drink, drink, smoke weed, you know, do drugs. My husband never drank, never smoked, but he was addicted to mm. hustling, talking anyone out of whether it was a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. He got a rush. He would go to the strip club and rob the dancers. He would chat them up. Are you serious? Buy him a, dr buy him a drink and reach around their back and go in their purse and come home with the money like, hey, look, this was the, she, she, he, people threw the most money at her. I, I'd be like, <sighs> and I would just pray. Damn. I would just pray. That was who I was married wow. to, man. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was over it, like I said, look, we got plenty of money. We need to go legit. We need to f figure out a business to invest in. Like, come on. He didn't want to do that. And um, this guy he had conned some money out of just recently, maybe got about 50, 60 grand out of the guy. And the guy knew it. And he was kind of still in our neighborhood. But again, you know, he couldn't go to the police. This guy comes up with now a new thing, like, oh, I'm going to go invest with, with dude. My husband tells me I'm going to go invest with dude. I'm like, dude, did you just robbed? Like, no, nah, that's not going to go well. That don't know. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. It's da -da -da. I said, I'm worried. And I say, no, I know he's trying to get you back. He don't know. He knows. I was like, trust your wife. Excuse me. Trust your wife. We know some stuff. He did not trust me. We lost all that and more mm. and that made me feel like you know what i can't do this no more because i'm like you're not valuing me as your partner and i and that's all us women want we will be submissive we will do what we need to do as a wife but we want to be heard and we want to be valued 
you know, and uh, he didn't. And it was on other things, too. And that kind of was the straw. And I said, you know what? I'm good. And um, we were living separately at the time. But, you know, we were still, you know, doing our thing. We weren't separated, but we were just both busy, you know, power couple. Um, but when I said that I was done and I wanted, you know, I didn't want to live with him no more. And we were kind of over, you know, that didn't sit well with him. And that's when the stalking started. Okay, let's talk about that. Is that when things got physical between y'all? Yes. Um, he started stalking me. Um, he started, when I, I moved to Virginia and I, I moved with my mom, with my son, and I, I still wanted him in Zaya's life because he was a good father, right? So mm -hmm, I still wanted mm -hmm. him in Zaya's life. And he would use that as an opportunity to manipulate me and try to, you know, get me to have sex with him and different things like that and try to force me to have sex with him. And it was bad, you know? And um, I didn't tell people because they looked at us like this Bonnie and Clyde and power couple and fairy tale and he bought her a house here and they're they driving G-Wagon and Hummers and they're just living their best life. But it was all this stuff going on. And here I'm this strong chick saying, put it in your mouth, all this, you know, from Queens and I'm hard and... I, no way am I in a domestic violence situation, you know? So I didn't want to share that with anyone. So it was tough, you know? It was tough. And I just thought, well, let me just leave him over there. He he ended up hooking up with this chick in Memphis. And, um, you know, he had other women, you know? He ended up hooking up with this chick in Memphis. Um, and uh, she was making money and he was, you know, getting money with her because I stop wanting to do those cons and I stopped doing the paperwork for him. So he had to get that, you know, he had to still get that adrenaline rush. Right. So he had to do that with other women and people and stuff. So, yeah, you know, it came to a head in Atlanta. It came to a head. In okay. Atlanta. So you're living in Atlanta at this point. He actually and, was in Atlanta now, before me. He was in he Atlanta was. back and forth from Atlanta to New York before me running around Atlanta. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't really care. I was just kind of glad that he was kind of leaving me alone. And um, mm -hmm. I ended up uh, working with this artist and uh, they we needed to come to Atlanta for something. And um, I kind of liked it. I ran into Rodney Jerkins and um, uh, Stevie J and all my New Yorkers. And they, yo, you need to come down here. Oh, I shouldn't have fell for that. But I did. <laughs> I fell for the banana in the tailpipe with the Georgia. But um, <laughs> shout out to everybody that, that's down here to flourish him. But um, so I ended up, you know, coming and, you know, he and I were kind of still on the outs. But, you know, we were still co-parenting and um, he helped me move. You know, um, he was always still getting money and uh, he helped me move and stuff and, you know, help get us in our little spot. But then, of course, if he helped that, he'd feel like he can come. So he would come every once in a while and everything and. You know, I kind of just, I didn't want no beef, man. So I was trying to keep stuff cool, but I still was like, nah, we're not together. And, you know, that was a problem, you know? So um, one day I was out with my cousin and he was going through my computer and saw some old messages from some dude. And they were years old at this point, but, you know, we've been married this whole time, right? And even though he was living with a whole other woman at this time, when the messages I'm his wife. I ain't supposed to, you know what I'm saying, be doing nothing outside of him, no matter what, no matter what. So he lost it. Oh, well, you cheated on me? And that was the first time that he physically, like, punched me. Okay, we ain't talking about a regular dude punching you. Fact. This man's hands, they're considered lethal weapons. Yeah. He is a prize fighter. He yeah. gets paid to put hands on people. On men. So when he punched, yes, put hands on men. And, and just for me to reiterate, he, he was a cruiserweight and lightweight champion. So he was no average fighter. Mm -hmm. You know, and not he, a little he guy. was good yeah. with his hands. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't a little guy. Mm -hmm. When he, he punched you, are you knocked out cold? Are you it, stunned like, like what the F just hit me? So the thing is, again, con man calculating. He didn't hit me to knock me out or to really hurt me, to put me in the hospital or anything. He hit me to prove that he was in charge. He was in control. I'm his. 
He hit me just enough to bruise my face, but not break it. He could have easily broke it. If he was in a rage, he could have killed me, right? So you ain't in a rage. You controlled when you did that. That was scary to me, you know? Okay, are, are we talking, when he, when he did that, are we talking about the fateful night? Or are we talking... No, we're talking, this, is, this was actually a month prior to him dying. A month prior, he had invaded my space, come to Georgia. I told him that, you know, we're not together. He wasn't really welcome, but, you know, he fought, kind of forced himself. And I'm going to name some names right now. Kenny Smooth was actually living in my son's room. He had asked me to, to um, could he rent a room for me? Um, so he was around. Shout to Kenny Smooth. He was around, but he didn't protect me. So he was there that down that yeah. time. Yeah. Okay, but but you got to understand. I can understand from Kenny's point of view. I, I you know what I've I've forgiven him now. Mm hmm. You know, but it still hurts. And um, I said mm -hmm. to him, I said, "Why would you leave, bro?" He said, "Cause he says he we we in there. He boop booping me, and this dude is like, yo, I'm gonna give you all a minute. I'm gonna go on out to the store. I'm like, Kenny, please. Mm. And he's like, you know. I was like, well, at least can you call the police? Like, what? Bro. Yeah, Kenny ain't want no smoke. And uh, when I asked him about it later, he says, well, you know, that dude is a prize fighter. I was like, I get it. I said, but guess what? So if it was your sister, you would have walked away? Nah, right. So that hurt. You yeah, know, yeah. that hurt me. Um, but, you know, my son was there also. My son was trying to grab him. And that was the first time he put hands on my son, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he was upset and mad, but he wasn't in that much of a rage. Like I said, I feel like he could have really hurt me or more at that time. Not to get too personal before you go until a month later. Yeah. Um, but I just want to understand. I know you guys weren't together. I know this is your space. You're living separately. But we have all broke up and had exes, but you're still intimate with them off and on. Is, was that the nature of y'all relationship at that point? Or were y'all completely separated? I was coerced and forced to have sex with him sometimes. Really? Yeah. Or sometimes it was easier to do that than to fight him. Women, we do that. You know? We do what we got to do sometimes to keep the peace. Wow. Okay. So, clearly... He's looking at it. You're still mine. Yeah. Yeah. Even though he's living with other women, doing his thing. Right. I'm his wife. And that's what he said. Because I said, you looking at, you mad about this. This is, you was living with Lisa at the time. I don't care. You my wife. And you never, and blah, blah, blah. And I guess, you know, a man just never sees his wife as sleeping with nobody else. No matter what they doing. It is what it is. Especially black men. You know, and he's Brooklyn, and you know, it is what it is, you know? And, um, yeah, that was bad. Okay, um, let's go to that fateful night. Yeah. He, 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 walk us through it, because this is a night that didn't end well for anybody. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if... Um, this is still emotional for you, which I would have to believe it is very much so. Of course. But if you, you know, just for the sake of of sharing your story and helping the, the, the audience understand, walk us through the wins, the where's, the why's, the how. So, so I can't give it to you because we have a deal on the table for the movie documentary, um, which is called I Did Not Kill My Husband. Because when you Google Kia Jeffries, it says singer kills boxer husband, you know, mm -hmm. which is not yep. true. That man died trying to kill me. OK, he beat me with a gun repeatedly in my head and face. And uh, he got shot in the shoulder and started beating me afterwards. And that's why the bullet moved to his heart and he died. So there's so many different facets and whys and different things 
oh my God, the police called me looking for a dead body after he died. There's so much going on. But all of this will come out in the movie documentary. But yeah. Okay, can you at least share with us this just psychologically? Um, you shot your husband. He was beating you. You acted in self-defense. But still, a life was lost. Absolutely. How, how do you rebound from something like that? In, in, and I'm talking about in the moment. In even, let's start from in the moment. You don't. Really? I don't know. I didn't know he was dead. We struggled over the gun, and I pulled the trigger to get him to let me go because he was holding on to me. And um, for the bullet to go to his shoulder, he could have sat down and be alive right now. We could be just talking about it together, you know? So this always makes me feel some type of way. So I'll never get over it. Um, I live with it. Every day. I live with if, it. If you don't mind me asking, where was your son? My son when was everything home. went down. We were actually um, not home. We, we weren't at my house. My son was at the house. So he wasn't there for that. Okay. He was not there no, at the moment. No. And I know okay. some of the reports. That's why we're doing this movie. Because once somewhere you could read it says my son was there and all this stuff. Um, you know, Mona Scott. Um, I was on this show called Gossip Game um, where Jazz Fly, you know, R.I.P. Jazz Fly, man. You, did you know Jazz? Jazz Waters? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. <sighs> so much has happened since the COVID, man. Yep. Yep. But yeah, you know, um, I don't think that the story was told when they edited it. It wasn't really laid out correctly because I got mm -hmm. a lot of calls from the family saying, oh, why did you say Zaire was there? I said, I did not say that. But if you look at that, how they edited my interview, you could get that from the way they put it, what I said together. So mm -hmm. that's why we're doing a movie so that we can have control over what's being said um, and everything. But yeah, it's, it's traumatic. Um, it has hurt me financially in this business. People have judged me and have, uh, you know, accused me of being a murderer and um, I've got bookings. And then when people Google me, they'll take the booking away and say they don't want their wife and kids around a murderer never murdered anyone in my life. I'm not a gun-toting person, you know? So it's hurt. It hurts. And um, a lot of people that I thought was my friend and my industry peoples, you know, they act very different for the last 10 years. So. Yeah, because this is, what are we talking, 2012, this, this all happening? The, the, you know, I couldn't imagine being in your situation and I and my heart goes out to you. It really does. Um, I appreciate it. Being being forced, like literally forced, to do something that that completely changed your world. I'm sure as a little girl and even as an adult, um, with all that you've accomplished, you never thought one day I would be in a position where I'm fighting for my life and somebody else loses their life. Yeah, never. Um. But I, I, I guess you're still a mother. And he, Ernest was your husband and your child's father. Yes. Walk me through the conversation with your child because he, he loved it. He had to love his father. He loved his father. He's still, if you look at my son's IG, he says, you know, RIP, I'm 16. The only man that could guide me through life, you know, whatever, he's gone, whatever. Yes, you know, my son, you know, we both, because we weren't able to go to the funeral, we both still feel like we see him every once in a while. We might ho be ho in ho ho Hold on, because I, I want to go to that night, or, or maybe it was the next day. How do you break that kind of news to your child? So, the week... Maybe a couple of days before that, my son, myself, and my cousin, who's like my brother, who saved me from my, my, my husband in front of my son in Georgia one time. I had to run, and he fought him for me. And um, 
we sat down one day and we were trying to talk about what could we do to maybe get him to leave me alone and stop stalking me. What could we do? My son was giving suggestions. Oh, maybe put him in a wheelchair, but mommy, he'll still come and get you. Oh, if you break his fingers or something, but he'll still send somebody to do something to you, ma. I know how he is. This is how my 13 year old was talking. So when I came home from the hospital, I already had a black eye from a month before that was trying to fade away, but was still there. So now I come home and now my whole face, I had staples, stitches in my cheeks. I look like Martin <laughs> on that episode that he got beat up by the, by the boxer, man. Mm -hmm. And my son, he looked at me and he said, he's dead, isn't he? Oh, no. And I just was like. And he hugged me. Did he know at that point it was by your hand? He didn't Did know he nothing. Know? He knew that I went to see him. And he knew that I came back by myself. And he knew that I came back bloody. He knew I had been into the hospital because he had been in touch with my mother. Uh-huh. And then what really hurts still is that. The boy did not go to school. I mean, he did not. He went to school the next day. And me and my mom, we were all saying, like, you know, nobody's going to fault you from, you know, taking a few days off. You don't have to go to school. You know, you can just kind of process. And uh, he said, no, nah, I'm going to go. No, nah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I said, but son, you don't have to go. He said, Ma, I can't look at your face. And I was like, okay. Okay. And that's how he had to handle it. At 13. You know? So, you know, we had minimal therapy at the time. Some white folks here. We were living in Dunwoody. So they didn't have any type of understanding as to what we, you know, had were dealing with. And that, you know. So we, you know, abandoned that. It wasn't helping. And, um, you know, we just did what black folks do. Put an H on your back and handle it, baby. And handle it. You and know? Handle it. And we've just, you know, thank God for my mom. She moved from Virginia. She was living in Virginia at the time. She came to Georgia um, and helped me with my son. And she's still here in Georgia. And, um, you know, my mom's oldest sister, she's a big influence on my son, um, looks out for him. And, you know, it took a village. And thank the Lord, he's okay. He graduated from college last year with honors. Beautiful. Congra congratulations. He, had a, a, he had, was on a full basketball scholarship to a D1. He went to uh, NIU, um, you know. Uh, whew, so, yeah. But it's tough. So I waited this long to kind of do anything like this because I wanted my son to be grown. Mm -hmm. And I wanted us mm -hmm. to discuss it and he'd be okay. Because it's, it's hard to discuss, hard to hear. Me and my husband's mother have not spoken since I sent my husband's body to Brooklyn for them to bury him. She is upset with me. And I begged that woman to come and get him. Send somebody to get him. That month from when he hit me, punched me in my face the first to the day he died, I was calling everyone, his brothers, everybody saying, listen, this ain't going to end good. And I thought it was going to be me the whole time. Because look at me. I'm 5'2". I'm that man was 6'3". And at the time, he was a little out of shape. So he was walking around with, you know, at 200. Easy. So I just, you know, I just want to say, listen, I, I work with a not-for-profit now called Whole Life Healing Center. And we work with domestic violence survivors. We help them transition from a, a shelter back into an apartment. We help them find jobs. We help them with clothing. We help them with their resume. We help them with so many things. We also feed the, uh, the hungry and help the homeless. We do our thing out here. And it gives me such peace to do that. But I also just want to share with ladies, like, I'm going to say this again. Look at it for what it is your life is in danger and get out of the way that don't mean that he can't change if he wants to but not if you want him to 
You got to protect yourself. Just like you protecting your kids, you got to protect you. You know? And he might have been here still if I had not been just so gung-ho on co-parenting and him, you know, being in Zaya's life. Maybe he needed to get his mind right before he could, you know, get, you know, be a co-parent right now. You know? You know. Yeah. You, you know, listening to you talk, and I don't want to sound insensitive. Um, so, so, so if I do, it's not intended that way. But somebody loved this man. He had a I mother. And I know. And, and, and hear where I'm going with this. He had a mother. He had family, fans. He had a child and he had you. And you guys loved him. Did you find that including yourself, people blamed you? And even when you looked at him, because I just listened to what you said, you, you, you just said maybe part of it was me. If I hadn't pushed co-parenting, if I hadn't tried to do all of it, maybe he'd be here today. If I hadn't gone to see him that night, I think about that all the time. I think about that all the time, every day almost. <laughs> this is wow. a terrible thing. It's a terrible tragedy. Me and his mom were really, really good people together. We were good friends. I love that woman still to this day. And I'm really, really appalled that this happened. But this is my life. What can I do? Just try to push forward and try to help somebody else, hopefully. You know, I'll say this. Yes, people blame me. People in the industry. I remember I went to the um, Bad Boy reunion. Mm -hmm. Carl Thomas got me tickets. I went to the Bad Boy reunion and I was hanging out with him at the hotel and C's came in. C's didn't even speak to me. And I knew it had to do with this situation. I said, what up, you C's? I know it did. I know it did. Because C's we all, they brother. knew this guy. So you, Diddy was trying to manage, okay, Jam Master J was managing my husband for a minute. R.I.P., man, this is hip hop history, okay? Jam Master J was managing my husband for a while. Jay, he gave us a, a, a truck a, a, that we were driving, and when he got into that trouble that ended up taking his life, he called us and told him he was letting him out of his contract because he had got into some beef with some niggas and he didn't know how the shit was going to turn out. This is real facts. Wow. Wow. So Diddy, at one point, was in competition trying to take my husband because he wanted to manage a boxer, and he wanted to take him from Jay. So Diddy, the whole organization, they knew me. I was working with Jack Knight and, and, and um, Stevie and, and, and Big. I, I worked on Biggie album, second album, you know? So they knew me, seasoned them. They knew us as a power couple. They knew him to be a man that would lavish on me, you know? This dude didn't let me hold a bag, especially in public. In public, he was the epitome of a dope husband to the world. He wanted that because his thing, when you meet him, he would say, hey, I'm Urban Ernest M16 Mateen, light heavyweight champion of the world, and my wife sings, put it in your mouth. Like that was his <laughs> spiel. <laughs> if anybody ever met him, they know that. So it hurt everyone. Yeah, I could only imagine, um, you know, uh, again, the way you described him, he, people loved him. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to separate the person that you know from the person that you, behind closed doors, knew. And um, because of the way it ended, you know, I, 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 I sympathize and I empathize with you. Um, I, I guess I'll ask you this question before we move on. If things, taking into consideration everything that happened that night, he's pistol whipping you, he's beating you in the face, he's on top of you, your life is clearly in danger. Would you have done things different? I don't know. 
that's honest. I don't know. I don't know. You know, sometimes I say maybe we shouldn't have got married because we didn't have an actual wedding. Um, or sometimes I say well, I should have pushed for the wedding so he would have had to, you know, see other people. And, and this is something I want to say. Push for the wedding. Have the wedding. Even if it's small, intimate, have your loved ones there so that you're holding each other accountable for you, uh, you guys' happiness and stuff, you know. So it's not a secret. You know, my parents didn't really approve of him. So I went ahead and went to the courthouse and married him when I was pregnant. I regret that, you know. Um, so, yeah, there, there are things that I wish I had done differently. Uh, but I would, I would be with him again. My son is amazing. Our son. Um, I definitely see him in his face every day. You know, well, when I see him. Um, but, yeah, I did not kill him. How, 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 you know, especially in our communities and you, you touched on this earlier, you know, we, we, we don't do the therapy thing the way that we hmm. should. Hmm. And it wasn't until the last couple of years, if that, that it really became, uh, where the okay. stigma was not attached to it. Right. How, how do you move on from something like this? Um, so musical therapy. You know, working, helping other people, helping the community, you know, watching my son grow, knowing that, you know, it wasn't a mistake. Our marriage, our coming together, us making a child, it wasn't a mistake. Um, that's it. I, it it's, it's been hard. And so I did come up with some music. Um, like I said, the, the movie's called I Did Not Kill My Husband and um, new music from it, Misery, Cry No More. Um, I've got music out on platforms. I've been working. I've been working. I, I Shout out to Raz Cass. I'm on that uh, Four Horsemen project. Um, shout out to Raz. With, with Raz Cass, Cannabis, uh, Killer Priest, and uh, Corrupt, right? Um, I'm on a joint. I'm about to come to New York on the 20th and shoot a video with uh, Craig G, Master Ace, and Lu Chin for new music that's just dropping. Um, I got a show on November 18th. I got a show in New York on the 27th. Um, I'm working, man. I've been making music and I've been just staying true to who I am. And, um, you know, when I go to the dark side, I, I bring myself back, you know? Uh, you know, you, you just said it best, music therapy. Um, we all have to find that thing that calms our spirit. Yeah. We all have to find that thing that as human beings puts us in the best place that we could possibly be in. Before I let you walk up out of here, I, I, I really want you to speak to somebody who finds themselves, woman or man, in a situation with somebody who they love and they're being violated, but they're not talking to anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of the problem. It is. Is you keep it to yourself. So if anybody who's listening, who's watching this, they're in a domestic violence situation, no matter whether it is physical, mental, uh, whatever it might be. Can, can you talk to that person? Yes. Definitely tell someone, even if you're uncomfortable telling anybody that this man knows, you can, there are hotlines out here. Again, Whole Life Healing Center, you can call us. We will help. We helped a lady, somebody um, right here in Atlanta, man had beat this lady up and ripped her clothes off her. She was butt naked on the, on the train. And the people called us and we went and sent our people with clothes and got her into a shelter and everything. So there are people out here to help. You might think that you're alone, but you're not. And you're not the only person with this story. And we know it, ha we know it happens to men and women. We know it happens to same sex couples and all of that. Tell someone, get out. Try not to let people uh, alienate you meaning keep you away from your friends and family. That's a sign, ladies and gentlemen. That's a sign. 
If they're if they're controlling, you know, when the hairs go up on the back of your neck and what's going on when people are trying to control you. It's a sign. When you talk to them about it, if they don't want to hear it, if they never want to admit to their thing, that's a, you got to get out. You got to move away. You got to let them reflect. You got to let them know it's a problem and see if they're willing to change their behavior. If they're not, you got to think about moving on. And do this before it gets crazy, before it gets to where you can't speak up for yourself. You know when you're meeting someone, when you're dating someone, even if they, you know, were so sweet and then now you married them or moved in with them and they're starting to act funny. You know what's up. Had the conversations. Don't let them kill your spirit. Don't let them stifle you. Don't stifle yourself to go along to get along. It's no fun to go along to get along, even if the money is great. I'm going to say that to the people, for the people in the back. It's no fun <laughs> to go along to get along, even if the money is great. Ladies, how many of y'all know that? How many of y'all marry for that buck, for that bag, and you are miserable? Oh, you fly. You got everything your heart desire, everything, but you're not happy. People taking their lives that live in mansions because they're miserable. Because they're not happy with who they with. They're not happy with who they are. They've compromised themselves. Let's not do that. You only got one you. And your relationship with God is the first one. It's most, most important. And he don't want you doing stuff to hurt yourself. So come on, man. And if a person loves you, they're not going to control you. They're not going to stifle you. They're not gonna, you're not going to have to change who you are. They Make sure somebody loves you for you. Good, bad, and ugly. I loved him. For who he was, good, bad, and ugly. But he wanted me to be a way, you know? Or he wanted to, you know, put me in this box. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to tell you, and we're going to end it here. Um, somebody needed to hear that. And maybe, just maybe, you know, this, this, this is why you went through what you went through so that you could be a voice. You can be an advocate. You can be a person that sounds the alarm and spread the word for somebody who finds themselves in a situation before it gets too far. So Kia, I, I want to say this real quick before we ahead. leave. You write about that and I want to bring it full circle. So to put it in your mouth song, 27 years old, the young ladies that are out here being, you know, the city girls, uh, Nikki, all these chicks that are like rapper turn, uh, sing, uh, uh, stripper turn rappers and stuff like this, all these sexy girls, they love to put it in your mouth song. But a lot of them have gone through the domestic violence or they have been. So I'm doing an all girl new millennium remix for put it in your mouth just so that I can mentor these ladies and mm -hmm. holler at them and be a, a, someone they could talk to, you know what I'm saying? That will understand them from where they at, you know what I'm saying? People put a stigma on strippers and all this type of stuff. Nah, you loved, you know what I'm saying? And let them know that they, you know, they got a purpose. So yeah, man, I'm out here in these sh-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-dee-d